Um, if you look at our, our city center, um, this is the same scale. You can see immediately there's a challenge. Um, not that we don't want to put in a tight grid network, we do have a lot of natural and physical barriers. We have the Rouge, we have the, the 407, we, uh, 407, we have the Gold Rail, we have a number of things that are physical barriers and we need to cross those barriers to allow us to have a, a good connectivity. How do we plan our movement? So we've talked a little bit about the infrastructure, the hard, the, the hard services. How do we plan for our movement? This is the conventional approach in the earlier days. We want to move cars. We want to move cars. And, and, and to move more cars, there are only two things you can do. More pavement. You widen the road. You grade separate. You put east-west traffic on one level. You put north-south traffic in, in the other level. So we end up with more lanes, more roads. The other thing we can do is to be, make it more efficient. Okay, make it more efficient. Move more cars with the same amount of pavement. We have system management, like the 401. The 401 has a compass system whereby they can early detect uh, incidents so that they can be removed quickly. We have ITS, intelligence um, transportation system, whereby uh, traffic signals are coordinated, uh, there are cameras, to reroute traffic if there are problems. So if our mentality is stuck on moving more cars, we end up with more pavements or more efficiency. However, we think there's another approach that we should be taking. We should be moving people, not cars. We should be moving people, not cars. Um, so transit, bike, pedestrian, these are all moving people. If we plan to move people and not simply moving cars, then there are other things that are open to us. We plan to improve the quality of the travel. Why are people so uh, frustrated when they're stuck in traffic? Because the quality of the travel is poor. Uh, there are a lot of things with urban design, driver's eye view, traffic coming that can improve the quality of the travel. Moving less people, fewer miles. Do we need to travel? Can they do other things that they don't even need to get out of the house? Um, one of the things that I'm doing more and more myself is uh, when I have meetings with uh, regional staff, I said, don't come down. I'm not going to come to you. Let's, let's do it over the phone. Let's have a conference call. Um, there are times that you can uh, meet people and work with people without actually leaving your office. So we have to think about all those other alternatives. Uh, video conferencing, uh, you know different than actually meeting the person. Um, so there are uh, if you think about moving fewer people, fewer miles, then you can think about the land use, the thing I talked about earlier on, mixed use. Uh, so your gym is only five, five minutes walk away rather than five kilometers. So you can walk rather than you have to drive. Uh, when we look at redevelopment, uh, we can look at transit-oriented design. We can look at telecommuting, demand management, stuff like All these things are, um, are now exploding in terms of um, picking up a bigger share of the way we travel. Uh, we also learn to manage, not simply to solve. Um, we, uh, there are new ideas, uh, a lot in the States and in uh, a lot of European countries, called road dieting. Um, you, you're not winding the roads simply because you feel there's a demand. Uh, you limit the number of lanes, uh, you change the standard of how you design roads, and therefore you're managing, not simply uh, uh, project and provide. That's what I said earlier. Could you just explain what stop flight? Stop flight is, yes, that's a good one. Um, when you have a non-stop flight in an in a, in a airplane, it means you go from A to B, and that's it. So you only pick up a number of people at one point, and then you drop them off at that point. But a stop flight means that you can stop at different locations, therefore you can, you can utilize that movement a lot more. It may be slower, it will be slower, but you're utilizing it to a more, you're optimizing the use of that, that, that trip. I can spend days talking about increasing travel choices, but I just want to leave you with a picture if, of, uh, of why we need to look at different uh, ways we travel. Um, I'm pretty sure if there are no gold trains, no subways today, Probably none of us would work in downtown. How, how many of you work downtown here? We have a few. I used to work downtown too, right? If there's no subway, no go train, uh, I think a lot of you would.
would not think about working downtown. The reason why I moved from Brampton, working in Brampton, commuting all the way to Brampton, to working downtown is because of Coltrane. I said I can take transit, uh, even though it takes about the same time, I'm not driving. Um, so you can see what we're doing out uh, on Highway 7. We are building transit. We're building uh, high quality transit. And there's a lot more we can do. Finally, uh, I just want to mention, out of all these thoughts, we've actually put it into our official plan some of the policies to guide us in our movement into the next 20 years. We know Markham is going to continue to grow. We know uh, car ownership is something that we need to be concerned about. We, we also concerned about the quality of life of um, Markham uh, citizens as well as Markham's employees. Uh, therefore, we need to make sure that commuting and traveling is not a burden. So, the first thing, integrating land use and transportation planning. There is increasing um, understanding of the impact of transportation planning and land use. Um, when I was working for the City of Toronto, I, I did a survey, uh, a household survey of travel modes uh, in the King's Spadina area. And, um, and I was surprised. Um, car ownership was high. Car ownership was high. But the people that drive to work is very low. I can't remember the exact numbers, but something like 10, 15 percent. That's the people, number of people uh, driving to work. They all have a car to go to the cottage on the weekends. Okay, so you can understand that because you can you live uh, and work close together, there are other modes of transportation available to, to me. I can walk home in half an hour. So if I couple with my wife and she decided not to pick me up in the evening, I'm not stranded here. I can walk home. Uh, so land use and transportation planning. Most of our trips we are concerned about are the commuting trips, the home to work and the work to home. But that's not all the trips. That's the trip, the majority of the trips during the rush hours. But there are a lot more other trips during the day. Okay, the retail trips, um, the trip to the, to the bank, the trip to the, the medical office, the trip to pick up the kids. These are all trips. And if we can generally lower the amount of those trips as well, it's better for the environment and better for the, for the, for the community. Influence the amount and the pattern of travel through education and policy. A lot of people, because they, they, they grew up in a, in, a, in a culture of driving cars, they do not realize that there are other options open. Um, I think the new generation is now beginning to understand that there are other options as well. Um, um, and, and, and how you travel determines where you live. Uh, if, you, if you are stuck on driving, you may want to live further and further away. However, if you, are, uh, if you, are, if you prefer to take transit, you probably live uh, along a subway corridor. And I've seen friends and uh, co-workers who've made uh, choices where they live based on how they travel. So we need to educate and we need to put policies in place to make sure that the general population is aware of these things. And again, we're talking about choices here. We're not forcing anybody to abandon the car. We're providing them with choices. Pursue a uh, transit culture and place priority on active transportation. Um, the transit culture is something that uh, we don't have much of in North America. Uh, we have a very car-oriented culture. Um, and we have to start um, thinking, planning, and implementing more transit uh, in the 905 as well. And, and transit, there are different types of transit, local transit, rapid transit, long distance transit, so there are different different types of uh, ways that we can uh, provide alternatives to driving. Um, place priority on active transportation. Active transportation is probably a term that you're not familiar with. Active transportation means moving under your own power. So it could be walking, it could be cycling, it could be skateboarding, it could be inline skates. So these are all um, different um, modes of transportation. And, and the city is very um, supportive of active transportation. And we have CPAC, the, um, the Cycling and Pedestrians Advisory Committee, uh, whom uh, Councillor Hamilton is uh, a member, as well as uh, Councillor Shaw. And uh, Peter is also an active member in that. 
And we have a number of uh, citizens and agencies who participate in that, and we meet monthly to talk about how we promote active transportation. Provide integrated cycling and walking networks. Walk, walking networks. Uh, again, very important. If you believe cycling is a mode of transportation, we better make sure that there are way, ways of getting around in uh, uh, a network that is, that is uh, uh, friendly to cyclists. Walking as well, um, when the 905s and uh, Markham and, and a lot of uh, other um, 905 areas were first developed, they were built for the cars and sidewalks are often missing. And uh, we're now retrofitting a lot of areas. Matching parking supply. We have uh, understood over the years that free parking is the, one of the bigger biggest uh, encouragement to, to drive. Uh, we, we know that if uh, you have to pay for parking, people will think about uh, whether they need to drive or not. Um, the need to pay for parking or the lack of parking or the lack of free parking will encourage people to take transit, to carpool or to, to take other modes of transportation. Uh, improve road safety. Um, I don't need to explain that. Facilitate uh, goose movement. Goose movement is another big area that uh, often at the municipal government level is not um, um, have a lot of weight and a lot of uh, importance uh, or not look at as important, but it's actually very important. Uh, imagine all the stuff that you have in your house. How, much, how many of them are moved by trucks? How many of them are moved by freight, rail, uh, and etc. So goose movement is important for uh, the economy and uh, important for uh, the industries. Phase developments related to transit delivery. We understand that um, transportation delivery is, is a complex uh, uh, issue and there are three levels of governance uh, developing transportation. So you have at the, well actually four if you, if you consider regional and local government. So at the federal level, they, they look after the waterways, they look after the airports. Um, at the provincial level, you have the, the 400 series highway, the King's Highway, uh, transit, um, the province through Metrolinx uh, fund a lot of the high order transit, uh, the, the uh, Highway 7 bus rapid transit out on the, out here is, is funded by Metrolinx. Uh, at the regional level, they have the regional roads, they, they, they operate the uh, York Region Transit. And at the local level, we uh, do our part in terms of the local, local road. And the other part that we play quite a bit in terms of um, impact in transportation is the way we approve developments. So we are, can approve uh, more development that are mixed use, we can look at certain density, we can make sure that those walkways are there and uh, there are different ways to get to uh, transit stops and things like that. So at the local level, the planning is also important. And then we, we want to support the long-term transit funding. So these are the major policies that are embedded into our official plan. And then I will just end with one last slide. And this is the official plan uh, moving forward uh, from today to 2031. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, we have Highway 7 here and Warden, which is here. So Highway 7 is our spine, our transit spine. Eventually the BRT system will extend all the way to Cornell. And the other spine is the uh, Young Street. Uh, we're patiently waiting for the uh, extension of the Young Subway from Finch to Highway 7. Um, we're, we're putting 80% of the future growth within the existing urban areas. And I think it's around 60% are actually along these two corridors. So right off the bat, we're putting the population employment along a transit corridor, so people have the choice of taking transit. If we put all that growth up here, then we're really in trouble. We're only growing about 20% of the growth is in the new urban areas up here. So, we have, so that's why I mean when I said I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that the way we're going forward makes a lot of sense. We're building uh, Markham Center, we're building land stuff, uh, we're building a number of mobility hubs and major development areas along the transit corridor. Not only are we putting density there, we're also putting mixed use. So um, all your amenities should be close by so that you don't have to get into your car. You have the choice 
of walking, biking, or taking transit. So that's the official plan of the city of Martin. 